Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we will be talking Sammy Sosa, Chris Dunn's face, and oh, what the heck happened to the Blackhawks? But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. The season is in full tilt, so head on over to icehogs.com. Pick up some tickets, hat, shirt, jersey, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Only 90 minutes from the city limits and fun for the whole family. Icehogs.com. All right, Alex. There's not a ton to talk about today, but there's there's some decent topics. Um. You know, there's a tiny, tiny bit of football, but not very much. Um, some cold stove action, but Sammy Sosa talk. And so little Bulls and little Blackhawks. What do you want to start with? Uh, you know, we haven't talked about the Bulls in so long. We might as well start with them. Yeah, so um, I've been watching more and more Bulls basketball as the weeks have gone on. And it's That's an odd thing that I didn't think I would say. Um, but they're not a good team. I'm not going to preface that, but say, oh, you know, this team is good, but they're not a bad team either, but they're really fun to watch. Yeah, they are. I mean, these young guys are playing with heart and passion. They're playing good minutes. They're, They're getting good time to play. It's not like they're letting some useless old veteran taking their place. They're getting the minutes and they're playing against all sorts of teams. And when I look at the Bulls, what I say is they're not good, but boy, there are just so many teams in this league that are far, far worse than the Bulls. Yeah. I mean, was it last night or the night before they played the Atlanta Hawks and Atlanta is the worst record in in basketball and you watch the Bulls play them, and the Bulls dominated. I mean, they they absolutely dominated. I mean, the score wasn't as nearly as lopsided as the game was, but um, it, it's just you know it's crazy to to think that uh, you know going into the season you assumed that the Bulls would be just right at the bottom feeder, and yeah, the record is not good, but uh, you look at you look at what they've done in the last few weeks, and you're like. Dang, this is pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I think that part of it was the whole Nico Miritich thing coming back. He came back, played really well. I think that energized the team. They had a streak of games against some bad teams, but they looked good against some good teams, even though they didn't win. They were in a lot of those games. They played some tough opponents. I think an interesting one was when they played the Golden State Warriors. They were in it through the first half. And I think they had a decent lead at one point. I didn't see the whole game, but then second half, the golden state warriors show that they're the golden state warriors. And you know, what can you do about that? But you got to like with what these kids are doing now. It's kind of hard because watching the kids has been so much fun. And I'll tell you watching this team over last year's team where you knew they weren't going to go anywhere is 10 times more fun. But you also want that good draft pick as well. And I think that the Bulls are going to start losing more games once they make some trades. And who knows what's going to happen with Chris Dunn, but at least try to look at this from many positive perspectives. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the thing to think about is uh, even if they... They get a top three draft pick. The, you know that doesn't guarantee that that 
player is going to be a superstar. Uh, I mean, they right. got Laurie Markkinen later in the draft, and he's turned out pretty well. Uh, it, it just, you know, it, it's just about scouting and, and sometimes sheer luck and how deep the draft is. But yeah, so, but you'd always rather have a higher draft pick than a lower draft pick because then you have the choice of who you get rather than a little bit of who's left on the board. Yeah, and you know, this this upcoming draft is full of some really good talent. So you want to get a hold of some of that talent right there. And like I said before, when the season started, I thought, boy, this is going to be like a top five worst team in the NBA. But when you get your young guys together, like Zach Levine coming back, and you had everyone just kind of working on things and starting to build a little chemistry, you realize that they're not nearly as bad as, say, the Atlanta Hawks or the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah, I mean, the Bulls, the Bulls, if they win their next game, they won't even be in the top 10 worst records. Yeah, you're right. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, they're they're greatly reducing their chances of getting the uh, <laughs> top three pick, but still, they're, uh, once they trade Nico, uh, this they'll start leveling off. Um, you know, they'll, they'll. I mean, they're still a team that's eighteen and twenty-eight, uh, and that's after a big win streak. So they're they're five games from being the worst record, and so it, it's uh, you know they'll they'll settle back in. I, I mean, I'm pretty confident that they're going to get a you know a top nine pick come draft time. But um, you know, it is nice to see what could be with another year and, you know, adding a, some, t uh, you know, top end talent, either free agency or, or with a draft pick. Right. Because when I looked at this season before it even started, especially when you had the whole punching Nico in the face ordeal and you knew you were going to have him out for a while and you knew things were going to be pretty ugly there and when Levine was still a ways away and when Dunn was still hurt, I thought, this team is so far away from contending. God knows when they're going to be even respectable again. But the past few months have really kind of changed the outlook on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, you know, watching... I mean, I, you could definitely see from, from the games oh, since Nico's been back uh, what could be. But watching the Atlanta game... And the, the Golden State game, uh, those two games in particular, really gave me some hope. The Golden State game is because you saw that they could run with that team. And granted, you you knew at some point that Golden State was just going to, you know, turn it on and and run, you know, run them out of the gym. But especially yeah, since we don't but have a bench, just to watch them be able to play with them and put up a lot of points on them was was awesome. But then the other one was the game, the game against Atlanta. Yeah. And one particular play just uh I mean it was it was a play that I saw several times was um Larry Markinen would would be at the uh you know the arc and he would he would start looking like he was going to shoot a three and everybody would collapse onto him and it would leave Robin Lopez wide open in the post you know with you know for an easy basket. And you're like all right. Well, this is this is kind of what happens with Kevin Durant. Is everybody has to collapse on him because he's a big man that can shoot a three, and uh, you know leaves somebody open somewhere. And you know you, now you've got Larry Markin, and if they don't if they don't collapse on him to try to prevent that three, he's going to put it up, and he's shooting pretty well behind the three point line. Um, if if they don't, or if they do, then it's going to leave somebody else open or uh, you know, if they go too hard for it, he can dribble step and get himself uh, an open look. It's, it's just adds a lot of flexibility to what this team can do. Take a minute and think about this. I was just thinking about this the other day after they beat the Atlanta Hawks. Think about last year when they got drummed by teams like Milwaukee and the Timberwolves several times those teams were young and athletic. Now you're seeing the Bulls beat teams like Milwaukee because last year the Bulls were not young and not athletic while this team 
is the exact opposite. I mean, think about what a difference that makes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this this team really is young and athletic. Uh, even even guys that they you know sent down you know they sent down Paul Zipser and and uh, uh, Felicio to D League, and you know those guys still fit that bill. They're fairly fairly young, fairly athletic. Um, it, it's this is a this is just a recipe for being able to compete. Is if you have old players, they better be wily and they better they better be money shooters, um, because you know the young athletic guys are gonna are gonna be right there with them. Um, but if uh, last year they had unathletic guys that weren't clutch, right, makes a big big difference. Last year, think about how frustrating it was how unathletic you were. And even though Milwaukee didn't have a, su- a superior record and other teams that were young and athletic but not good records had, but the Bulls were, quote, better on paper, they got manhandled. I just think that that's one of the things that's not really being talked about enough, I don't think. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, wa- watching the game the other day against Golden State is – uh, all, uh, this is kind of a, an apology eh? is, you know, when the season started, we went back and we beat up the, uh, Gar packs for selling that draft pick that led to be Jordan bell. And we're mm-hmm. like, well, the bulls could really use this guy, blah, blah, blah. And they sold him for cash, blah, blah, blah. And for the most part is you could just be like, well, you know, that, that made sense is, you know, if the bulls, the bulls are passing on a guy that the NBA champs have, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but now that you, you go to look at it is really realistically is the position that Jordan bell plays. The bulls don't have a ton of, um, you know, room for that guy is, uh, you know, they ended up, they gave them some flexibility by not having Jordan Bell. They ended up getting, being able to get David Nwaba, who has been defensively, uh, you know, a real big standout for them. And, um, you know, he's played in, uh, he's playing more minutes per game than Jordan Bell. He's averaging more points per game. Um, uh, better three point shooter more rebounds per game, uh, right around the same assists per game. Um, so it, it's, you've got, you got a guy that um, is playing just as well offensively and is a much better defender than, than Jordan Bell. So, you know, honestly, it, the Bulls were, were smart in what they were doing. They, they allowed themselves the flexibility. So when a David Nwaba, uh you know, was available to them, they were able to, to pick him up. You know, it's one of those things where most people ripped it at the time. I can't think of one good person that tried to spin it a positive way when it happened. It just shows that sometimes things play out differently than what everyone expects. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it may be a situation where Garpax just lucked out and it worked out. But, I mean, it could have been that they, they knew what they were doing and I'm not ready to give them the benefit of the doubt yet. I'm just saying I apologize because I was wrong and this did work out, whether it was dumb luck or some sort of skill and ability. Yeah, we'll never really know. But I guess at the end of the day, if it works, that's all that matters. Um, yeah, and also with the Bulls, uh, Chris Dunn has been playing just really great basketball for them. Um, if you would have told me he would have been playing like this when he first came, I wouldn't have believed it. Well, I mean, coming out of college, if you would have told me he would play like this, I'd have been like, yeah, absolutely. He's a really good player. But what we saw in in Minnesota, that Chris Dunn, you're like, no, no, I don't see it. Um, so I don't know if it's um, playing for, you know, change of scenery or if it's something about um, Hoyball that, that's helping him out or if it's just having another year in the league. 
I don't know what what the difference is, but it's uh he's he's playing like the the Chris Dunn that we thought we were going to get when we saw him coming out of college. You know, maybe all those factors you listed played into it. Maybe the change of scenery was necessary. The change in coaching was necessary. Because when you think about it, a change of scenery is a change of coaching. So I think both those things could apply to him. But it, uh, maybe, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but just as a thought. Um, but yeah, the other night is I don't know if you saw the dunk he had. Yes. Yeah. So if you guys didn't see that. He, he made a nice dunk, but the momentum just carried him and his fingers slipped and he went face first into the hardwood floor. Uh, I, I mean, it looked bad when when you watched it alive, but slow mo was it, even worse. It's, yeah, it was one of those ones that, like, sometimes, like, you're like, oh, it looks really bad. But then when you watch it in slow mo, you're like, oh, you know, it, uh, you know, he he caught himself with his chest and his head didn't touch the ground or something. No, no, this was worse. It was so worse. Um, and ultimately, he gave himself a concussion and chipped teeth. And spoiler alert, the fist of Bobby Portis had no play in this whatsoever. It was just the hardwood floor. Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully, can you imagine if, uh, if the Bulls got that same Nico effect where... It, uh, this this hit made Chris Dunn an even better player. Oh, gold mine! <laughs> if that's the case, then you will, all the Bulls players are going to be going out and giving themselves concussions and broken faces. Well, let's punch each other in the face. No, uh, maybe that's what Felicio needs. Ooh, mm. yeah. and Paul Zipser. <laughs> I forget Paul Zipser's a thing. Yeah. I honestly do. And it's funny because Zipser didn't play bad last no, year. No, we were all talking about what a surprise Paul Zipser was, and then Paul Zipser just disappeared. Yeah. I don't know if it's the change in the, the team dynamic or it was just kind of a fluke year. I don't know. Uh, maybe he was disappointed that that punch didn't land in his face. Hey, <laughs> who knows? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, yeah, but... The Bulls are are playing a fun brand of basketball, and you know, record aside, it's still not good. But um, you see glimpses of of what could be, and the Bulls are going to have stupid amounts of money to spend come uh, off season. So they could they could easily throw out a max contract and still bring in another player. Um, it's just. I haven't looked very far ahead. Do you know who would be like kind of on the market? Like what key names would be on the market in free agency? Kevin Durant. You, re- you, you think he would oh, come? Zero here. chance he's coming here. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, gonna I'm say. just saying he's he's going to be a free agent. Um, that is true. I'm going to look at him now. Yeah. Isn't LeBron a free agent too? LeBron, DeAndre Jordan, DeMarcus Cousins, Paul George. Uh, you know, Boogie Cousins. It's a good class. Boogie Cousins is a really good basketball player, but damn, if he's not a pain in the ass. <laughs> and I it, know, you know, it's like a Dwight Howard situation where you know you everyone lines up trying to get him, but then you get him, and you're like, you get you know buyer's remorse because he doesn't, it doesn't uh, result in in victories or playoff berths like you expect. Um. Which is just a shame because the guy is as talented as it comes. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like if you could get him with a better attitude, then you know he could he could really be something. Yeah, I I think he's one of those guys where talent wise he deserves to win a championship, but with all the other stuff, you see why he hasn't come close to winning a championship. Oh yeah, I you know it's it's funny because I mean, you know, you hear about like the things he does off the court, and he seems like he's a really good guy. So I, I'm not knocking him there, but it he's a pain in the ass to front office and head coaches and teammates and and you know he doesn't do the things that that make you win, um, right? You know, so I I don't know if that's the guy that you want to bring in or not. Uh, 
and LeBron. Well, remember, he was kind of the subject of so many trade talks and whatnot in the old days when it was still like the the Butler and Rose era. You remember that every year they, they would talk about, oh, are the Bulls going to go after Cousins? Are the Bulls going to go after Cousins? And they didn't. Nope. Uh, but, you know, right now we're we're in the midst of when is Nico getting traded? And it seems like it's pretty likely he will, just a matter of when. Yeah, it's just what are we going to get for it? I mean, it seems like the Bulls are sticking to they want a first-round pick, which, uh, you know, if, if he's going to go to Utah, that's – that's going to be a, a tough one because um, Utah is, is not a good team either. But like they're right now, they would be the eleventh pick, um, and they, you know, there's a bunch of teams bunched right up. I mean, this could easily be another top ten pick. Uh, mm-hmm. So, did, are they trying to give up a top ten pick for Nico? Um, is that realistic though? I mean, is it realistic to want that? I don't know. I just don't I just don't know what how how much he's valued outside of the organization because um you know, he does have a full no trade clause, but there's a loophole that if the Bulls pick up the second year option on his contract that uh it bypasses his trade clause and they can do whatever they want with him. So it doesn't really matter his input. But the thing about the, the picking up the second year option is does that make him more valuable because you get two years of Nico, or does it make him less valuable because it's your you know the money he's locked into instead of being an expiring yeah, contract? I mean that's a good question to ask right there. That's a great question to ask. There's multiple situations which could argue either or. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I guess it depends on the team. Are they trading to get a guy that can help them this year and then is an expiring contract and they have the cap flexibility, or are they trading a guy that they want to actually use as part of a, you know, their team going forward? I, I don't, I don't know. I can't answer that. And only, only. Uh, well, he's at that. No, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go, go, go. Ahead. Um, yeah, the only people that can answer that are. Is, you know, the front office of that other team and and maybe the Nico. Right. What I was just going to say was he's at that point right now where he's playing really well this season, coming off a bad season, but you could see him playing into a team's game either or long-term or short-term because he's old enough where he's got experience, but he's young enough where he could be part of a team scheme for some time now because he's only, what, 26? Yeah, 26, 27. So, yeah, he's still got years and years left. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't I don't know what the, you know, a team would want to do with him. And I guess it probably depend on the team. Um, you know, Utah apparently is trying to dangle a player. And I, I don't know if that's what the Bulls want. I think they want to just have draft picks um, instead of having to lock somebody up. You know that, right? So I don't know. It's you know the the trade deadline's not for another couple of weeks, but I honestly thought the Bulls were going to trade him like Monday or Tuesday. I really thought that. I thought so too because there were a lot of rumblings about it. Yeah, a lot. I was kind of waiting to wake up and see a, trade. a lot of rumblings. But I guess you know what John Paxson said was true is that if this doesn't benefit the Bulls, they're you know they're going to be patient with it. And that's, you know, really what they're doing. Um, you know, you're like, well, they'll win more games with Nico and they don't want to do that. Uh, I mean, the, the trade de- isn't the trade deadline in like three weeks. Like how many more games are they, Something like that. Are they how many more games are they going to win in those three weeks? You know, an extra three, maybe four. Okay. Who cares? It's not going to be that big of a difference in your draft pick. Um, yeah. yeah, and wanting the best deal out of it, that's understandable. You get that. So, um, you know, he's he's open to be traded at any time, but he's it's, it's just going to be finding that right deal. Yeah, we'll be uh, 
eagerly waiting, and I'm sure Robin Lopez is going to be on the trade block as well. Oh, yeah, you, you have to think that. And that's somebody that it's uh, can help a contending it's team. It's too bad because I really like him. I like him too. It wasn't a guy that I wanted him to sign when they, they got him, but um, but honestly, it's he's – He's played really well. He's been a good teammate. There's been no problems. Uh, February 8th is the trade deadline. So Okay. Um, so right after the Super Bowl. Yeah. So we we really don't have that much longer before the trade deadline. Um, we're looking at like two and a half weeks. Um, so yeah. It's yeah, there's there's not gonna be that much of a differential if they trade him today versus the eighth, but he's definitely going to be gone, you know, within that time period. Yeah, I would imagine so. Uh, so that's bulls. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I would love to see two top 10 draft picks. Uh, you know, I know the bulls would try to parlay that into a, a higher pick, but I don't see that happening, but having two, you know, it would be uh, – hopefully they would learn from the Doug McDermott trade and they'd keep the two top 10 picks rather than trade up a couple spots to get you know, a slow white guy. Yeah, I mean, there's – obviously that would be the best scenario, but, you know, I don't, I don't have pixie dust on me. Yeah, I mean, honestly – I could only wish. From what I read is that the, the top three picks are the studs and – um. So if if you're not going to be able to get in that top three, you might as well just keep the two top ten picks and uh and and you know have have more bites at the apple. Yeah, because I mean, think about it. The mo the more you get, the better you are off. Yeah, the I mean, more chance you have at succeeding. More chances you have at succeeding is correct. Um, and you know if you hit. On both guys, that's <laughs> that's a that's the ideal scenario. Absolutely. So as we go into the the next subject, before um, I don't know if you had any anything more to say about the Bulls, did you? No, no. I just wanted to briefly touch on the NFC Championship game right now, and I am completely stunned by this heroic performance by Nick Foles. I just wanted to point that out because I know there's not a lot of Bears talk. So I figured if we did any football talk, this is something that I really just kind of wanted to bring up because this is incredible. Yeah, I mean, you think about it is just a couple of years ago, he had that season where he had, what, like two interceptions? Um, he's not a bad quarterback. Is Andy Reid brought him in and Andy Reid developed him and Andy Reid was very high on him. And why everyone thinks he's terrible is he had a stint with Jeff Fisher. But Todd right. Gurley was terrible with uh, Jeff Fisher. Jeff Fisher is just uh, – he is a dinosaur of a coach. Yeah, and I remember there was some fear among the Bears fan base that Jeff Fisher would be the Bears' next head coach, but I think most people really did think that that was never going to be an option because I don't think any team would be dumb enough to hire him at this point. I, I at least I don't think so. Yeah, no, Ryan Pace was not going to hire him, and there's you know the rumors no. that oh he he might be in line for some sort of job. Is what job are you going to give him? Like what? Jeff Fisher should just retire. He's made a lot of money. You just go retire and do whatever it is he does. Um, Nick Foles is not a bad quarterback. Is he a quarterback that you want to ride with for 16 games and try to go to the Super Bowl? Probably not. But is he is he one of, if not the best backup quarterback in the NFL? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, he's someone that if you need to trust him for a game like this, I, he's just proven that he could do it. Because going into this game, I thought, man, Nick Foles against this Vikings defense? Ah, oh, I don't know about this. But, wow. I mean, he just threw another touchdown pass. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that the Eagles went in and they are exploiting all weaknesses of the Minnesota Vikings. And um, 
they're finding the gaps in the defense and they're keeping them, the defense guessing and on their heels and, you know, aggressive top defenses. When you keep them on their heels, um, that's, that's how you beat them is when they, when they're allowed to dig in and dictate how the, the, the game is played, that's when they dominate. I mean, look at the AFC game. You saw Jacksonville just absolutely dominate Tom Brady and, and the Patriots. And in the second half is, you know, it's almost like not having Gronkowski um, forced the e, uh, the Patriots to to change how they were going to play the game. And it led to more, uh, you know, keeping Jacksonville's defense on their heels. Um, and in the second half, they... I mean, I guess as far as you can go with Jacksonville, uh, you know, having your way with that defense, they sort of had their way with the defense in that second half. Yeah, I mean, you watch the way that the Jacksonville Jaguars were smothering Tom Brady. They were smothering the run game, and they were get, they were getting to Brady too. Even if they weren't sacking him, they were constantly putting some pressure on him, uh, whether it was Brady on the throw or Brady on the handoff, and then – like you said, the second half happened, and look, Tom Brady just – I can never, ever, ever pick against them at this rate. I just can't. Even with the way the, the Eagles are playing right now, I still think the Patriots are going to find a way to win another Super Bowl. It's just – it's really hard for me to pick against them. Yeah, I mean, he's – I hate the guy, but he's really – good and it's funny because everyone talked about his hand and his hand um his hand was fine and the only thing that made him look like he was 40 years old was when he tried to take off and run and <laughs> it looked like it looked like when scooby-doo tries to run and he and he's like moving his legs like crazy but he's he's just uh you know staying in the same <laughs> spot in the air. Uh, that's like tom brady he's like feet are going but he's not going anywhere um and he's just like, oh my god, he's so slow. I mean, he was never a nimble guy, but whew, at f n not nimble guy at forty, man, he he is slow. Yeah, that's kind of an understatement. As Scooby Doo is a a pretty funny way to put it. Uh, but I, it was that game was painful to watch. I mean, it was a good game, but oh my god, Tony Romo, like that guy. Like I swear he has, he's got like eye black on, and he's got a, probably has a jersey on, is beating a war drum. It, it, it's like he's like the Ron Santo of of football. Like he's not, he's not really a good announcer. He's just a a guy that's yelling. He was making some very odd noises, but you know what? It's entertaining. At least it's entertaining. Uh, Tony Romo. But but that was a it was a good game and I I think the the X factor in that was uh, Brady being able to score before the half ended. Um, if uh, I think if they would have held them there, uh, I think that would have dictated the game or you know changed the way the game was played in the second half. I told my friend uh, when they scored, I said that's huge. I said that's absolutely yeah. huge. My wife, uh, she didn't watch that game, but she's an Eagles fan, so she's... But she's pretty happy future. right now. Yeah, um, but she came down right before half when Patriots scored, and I was like, she's like, how's this game going? I was like, I th I thought that the Jaguars had this uh, this wrapped up, but uh, like Brady scored, so that means the Patriots are going to win. <laughs> and and I was like, that at that moment, I was like, that that's it. You know, when the Patriots were starting to drive near the end, it's almost like you knew for sure the Patriots are going to win. You had no doubt that the Patriots were going to win. You, ju you just knew it. And you got to give a lot of credit to their defense on that last Jaguars drive. I can't remember who it was, but it was a pretty decent pass by Bortles, but he just went up and just spiked it on the ground. That was... That's something you don't see very often where a defensive play saves the Patriots other than Malcolm Butler in the Super Bowl a few years ago, obviously, but you know, that was that was a big play. And and watching uh both of these games just really hammered home the point. 
um, in my head is that the one of the biggest thing that the Bears are missing is wide receivers that have great hands. Watch some of these plays as these guys are just laying out, and they're not. I mean, they're they're you know Brady might have some bad throws, but his receivers are are making great catches. So they may, they look like great throws. Like nobody was going to catch that where Brady put it. It's like that wide receiver had to do like three cartwheels and make a one handed grab. And I'm um, like the bears receivers don't do that. They drop balls that hit them in two hands. Yeah. Like, I mean, what was it that catch Edelman made? That was really good diving to his right. That was awesome. Yeah. All those plays. Uh, it, it's just like, you know, if that was the same throw was made for the Bears, you just like instinctually no go. Well, they're going to drop it, and and you're like, all right, well these teams are like they're going to catch it. You know, it's like oh, it's twelve feet over his head. Somehow he'll jump thirteen feet and make the catch. It, it's it's incredible, and you're like, it, it's it's astounding to watch a good wide receiver play. And yeah, it really is painful we to watch Alshon seen. Jeffrey. Yeah, it's painful to watch Alshon Jeffrey because you're like, man, we had this guy, but he got hurt every 10 seconds and you couldn't keep him on the field. Yeah. Uh, which makes me think that that's it's something with the Bears because he's he's been fine with the Eagles and you know, watching him catch touchdowns as he's going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, it's something that Elshon Jeffrey gave us for a few years. Brandon Marshall gave us for a little bit, but overall, you just really haven't seen it much in Chicago. No, and, it, and you don't even need like, I mean, look at Adam Thielen. It's not like you have to have this uh, top five wide receiver pick in the draft. It's you just need a guy that's it's got good hands and runs runs good routes. Um, you know, Alshon Jeffrey was a second round pick. Adam Thielen was undrafted. Um, I don't know where uh, Edelman was, but I don't think he was a very high pick. Um, you know, the only the only wide receiver that was drafted high in any of uh, in these games was um, Treadwell from the Vikings, and he was their first round pick. I think he was eleventh or eighth, and. I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I, when everyone was talking about that guy being a high draft pick, I was like, uh, uh-uh, he's going to be a bust and toot toot. He's a bust. Mm hmm. Mm, depressing. But, but yeah, so it, it's, you know, you don't necessarily need these high draft pick guys or big money free agents. You, you need guys that can run good routes and catch and, you know, have good hands. Uh, and let the let your system develop them look make them look better with uh, using your scheme to get guys open instead of having to have a bunch of guys that are physically dominating like Des Bryant uh, or Antonio Brown. Um, you know, use your your scheme to get guys open, kind of like the Patriots do, and where they can plug in uh, you know guy off the street in and and get him eighty five catching yards. Mm-hmm. I think that going into the future, looking at what kind of offense they're going to build around Trubisky, I think they got to take a lot of notes at the way those type of guys play because you, you just need that to succeed in the NFL. It's such a passer game now, and it's just essential. I think that's one thing that they really need to concentrate on is not only getting good receivers, but just the fundamentals of it. Don't have guys that have passes bounce in and out of their chest. If they if they can't get guys like that and it doesn't work, then you're not going to win. That's why this building this wide receiver core is so important. Yeah, and uh, this you know sort of leads a little bit into a question we had and a couple of the small things that I wanted to talk about with the Bears. Um, the thing I love about what the Bears are doing under Nagy so far, and, and we can't judge him on anything on the field because he hasn't taken the field the Bears yet, but the staff he's putting together, I love it because the, if you listen to these guys talk, all the things that they're talking about is is 
making a dynamic offense, having an offense that uh, takes from college the best parts about college, the best things in the NFL, uh, being able to exploit matchups, um, you know, using your scheme to to create uh, matchup issues rather than having to have players to uh, create matchup issues, and and all of these things are uh, just it's like a it's future and forward thinking. It's progressive, and and that's what I love about it. Um, you know, you uh, one of their offensive assistants was interviewed, and he said something along the lines of, "You know, we're not moving forward because the you know the dinosaurs didn't move forward and and they died." And you're like, I like that. Absolutely thinking. is, uh, you know, and and one of the things that the terms that we've heard a lot of is is RPO, run pass option, um. And the the Bears are going to use that, uh, and it's the the Bears aren't new to it. They've they've used it before with Adam Gase, um, but uh, it's so kind of a, a X's nose one on one. The run pass option is when you go up to the line of scrimmage, you have a run play and a pass play uh, that. It's the quarterback's choice of how they're going to do it. So when the ball is, it's it's different than an option. Uh, but the all the other players on the field are going to run the, you know, assuming like the offensive linemen are going to block, if assuming it's a run block, and the quarterback is going to read. Um, there's going to be a defender. Typically, there's a defender that's that has the option of coming down to be like the eighth man in the box or reading the offense and deciding to step back and be uh, a pass defender. And that's, that's the guy that you try to exploit in the run pass option is if you see him, when you, when you snap the ball and you're going to make the handoff, you see if he comes down and if he comes down to, to, to fill in a gap on the run, you you just go for the the uh the pass play and exploit the hole that he was in because it's going to create a gap um if you see he doesn't bite on it then you make the handoff and go that way and the offensive linemen are are run blocking all the way so they don't give it away um it's a way of of creating uh an ex- exploitation of the defense because if you think about it is there has to be at least seven players on offensive line. And if you look at the gaps, there's going to be a gap on either side of the end guy plus each spot in the middle. So there's eight gaps. And if you break down the backfield, um, there's a total of eight different uh, pass zones that you have to defend. So you have 11 defensive guys that need to cover six basically eight gaps plus eight um you know pass windows and if you are able to uh you know read off of one guy and make him bite on the wrong thing that creates a mismatch for you when you already have the benefit of of having um you know not enough guys to cover every zone so it's a it's a really it's a really forward thinking thing, and and the reason that it's it's been a college, it's been predominant in college and not so much in the NFL is, um, if you if you fire out with run blocking, and you end up throwing a pass, uh, in the college you have three yards to be able to block a guy during a pass, but the NFL is you don't you know you have like one or two yards, um, so if you you know, you can call be called for a downfield block in the NFL. So you got to be a little bit careful, but in college you don't. So you've been able to, uh, to really exploit these guys. Um, you know, a team like Michigan doesn't really, uh, get beat up by the, the, the RPO per se, because their defense, um, they have, they don't have guys that that'll read and go, you know, go down to make a, to be an eighth man in the box or pop back. If he thinks it's going to be a pass play, um, they do a base, 
um, cover one. So guys already have a specific spot that they're supposed to cover. So they just maintain their coverage. So the run pass option, you know, is uh, negated a little bit. But in the NFL, especially with a team like the Bears, where they're they've got a great running back and they've relied on the run play, uh, you'll see you'll see a guy cheat up in the box and being able to exp- you know take advantage of of a guy like that instead of running into a, a wall and a guy right in that gap is you can throw an easy pass to the the gap that he left by coming you know up to the box and and really um, you know take advantage of it and and you'll see a lot of teams do it is the Bengals done it um, Adam Gase does it uh, you know you've, you've seen a lot of guys do it Patriots have done it Eagles have done it um, and, and it's not like that's something that the Bears are gonna do all the time but they're gonna be able to put those in uh, and it's gonna it's going to create options when teams are trying to take away the run game. Well, I think the key words were adapt or die because I think that us wanting to adapt into a nice team that actually adjusts, a team that actually has good spread out play calling and can actually play a modern scheme is something we've been waiting for for a very long time. I think everyone should really like what they said about that. I I certainly did. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's nice to hear because you you went out and you got this, um, you know, young quarterback that you you think is going to take you to the promised land, and you want you want to create a dynamic offense for him that's going to, uh, you know, when Adam Gase left, the what really frustrated me was John Fox basically was like. Well, just because he left, it's still our offense. We're going to run our offense. It, it was our offense all along. And yeah. you just wanted to bang your head against the wall because you're like, no, no, it, it was it was what Adam P- Gase put into place. You didn't have an offense. So you're probably going to use some of the things that you knew about that Adam Gase offense, but you're not you're not the one that's creating this. Is you know, it's a big difference between somebody that copycats and somebody that originates um you know this is they're they're building an offensive scheme and they're they're they've got a lot of of guys from different walks of life that are being incorporated to develop it and uh you know you want to be able to you know to to create this dynamic offense and build around the strengths of the players you have rather than be a Mike Martz and trade away Greg Olson because your existing scheme doesn't utilize a tight end. <laughs> you want to take, you're like, well, we've got a Greg Olson who's a really great uh, pass catching tight end and and cater our offense to the player, that style of player rather than vice versa. Well, let's just kind of hope that this all turns out for the best because I'm really tired of watching these playoff and championship games and the Bears not even close to them. Yeah, I mean, if the if the Patriots win the Super Bowl, um, they're going to have as many Super Bowls in the past two years as the Bears have been to ever. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, they already have more Super Bowls than Tom Brady alone already has more Super Bowls than most teams in the NFL. Yeah, it's really it's yeah, just frustrating. And um you know, you, you need to be able to to build a a solid foundation for yourself to be able to compete. That's that's the thing, is the Patriots have built this solid foundation. They found the quarterback that um, to plug into it, and everything else is is just gravy. So you have, uh, you know, when you've got a solid f- foundation, you've got a great quarterback. Is if you lose, if you you know, wide receiver goes down, you plug in another guy because you've already got a system in place and you've got the quarterback to do it. It's the bear. What the Bears have been suffering f- through for the last. 
50 years is not having um, a quarterback that's a good quarterback. And it's if you can't solve the quarterback situation, then you, know, you don't have a foundation and you, you can't build off of anything. Right, exactly. Um, so what else? Um, so yeah, I mean, the only other thing I said wanted to mention with the Bears is uh, free agency starts on March 12th. So, you know, it's going to be a pretty big, this will be like the big lull as far as Bears fans go because um, who cares about the Pro Bowl? You're going to have the Super Bowl, and we're not in it. And then it's going to be like a month and a half before free agency starts. And, and you know, that's that's the exciting part of, of our offseason is we have a new head coach. It's what players are we going to bring in to fill gaps. And then you don't have the, the draft until the end of April. So it's, uh, you know, this is, this is a pretty – big lull as far as the NFL goes for the Bears. Yeah, it really is. I think that one of the things that we'll be thinking about during that lull is there's going to be mock draft after mock draft, scenario here, scenario there. It's one of those annoying points where you're so sick of mock drafts and discussions, you're just ready for the real thing. Yeah, yeah, at a certain point. Um, and I, I hate whenever it's like, well, Mel Kuyper said. Like, I don't care what Mel Kuyper said. There's a reason that Mel Kuyper doesn't have a front office job is because he's like, I don't know what his expertise is. He's he's just a self-proclaimed draft expert. Um, And so just because he says, oh, the Bears are going to draft this guy, who cares? He's just, he's trying to justify his own job rather than, you know, that's what the Bears are going to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I love scouting the the draft, and I I do mock drafts oh, that's here always and there. Fun. And I love I love doing a mock draft here and there, but they're more or less just, um, you know, kind of a guess for me is is where I'll where these guys will be or what what you know trying to guess. But um, well, just after a while, you're you're so eager to finally see it unfold and see how right or wrong you were. Yeah, and when that day comes, it's like. Honestly, my wife, she knows this is true and, and drives her crazy, but like the the NFL draft weekend is is like a million times better for me than Christmas. <laughs> and I, uh, wow, yeah, I, I just like I am so giddy when it comes. And I used to I used to go up to the draft and when it was in New York, I used to go up you know every year for several years. And it was, it was a, does picky claws come and visit your house? <laughs> he does not, but you know, I, I definitely, uh, now that they've moved it to, you know, the prime time on, uh, you know, the nighttime event is uh, like, I'm basically useless at work that day because I'm just like, is there any news? Any news? Did anybody get caught smoking pot out of a gas mask? <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, I get home and I race home and I just like, and I sit there and I'm like, how many more minutes before the Bears draft? How many more minutes before the Bears draft? But yeah, it's a blast and I I, I love it. And my wife's like, you you videotape the channel that you're not watching. So you, I'm like, yeah, well, I got to go back and watch what they said about these guys. Man, you are all about it. Uh, yeah, it's a it's it's a sad addiction. Uh, all right. Do you want to move on to a little bit of baseball? Sure. Um, yeah, I know there's a topic you wanted to get to, so let's just knock some of the other, couple other things out of the way. Um, I, last week we talked about how long before somebody major starts dropping the C word, uh, C word being collusion. And, um, I can't remember who it was, but I, I sent you a, uh, a tweeted to you that I heard it on the radio. Um, was it Jesse Rogers or somebody that um, said it? And then Scott Boris has hinted at it already. So the it's out there now. And, yes, it is. And I don't know if 
there's any evidence that you know baseball will get their hands slapped again. Uh, but there's definitely something going on, and it's it's going to be a situation now. Is who breaks first? Is the are the because at some point either the players are going to have to be like, no, no, I need a team, and they're gonna they're gonna accept a lower offer and go somewhere, or the teams are gonna just break and somebody's gonna come out and be like, yeah, I can't wait any longer. Here's a bunch of money. Come on, you Darvish. You know, there's rumblings right now that there have been uh, offers to Darvish from the Brewers, and Ken Rosenthal just confirmed this. I, think, I mean, I'm sure he's got offers from a lot of people, but I wonder if it's a legitimate offer like that he might actually take. Yeah, there's no like, oh, he's going to definitely take this. There's none of that. It's just they're saying the Brewers have made him an offer. I know that there were talks that he was – offered a contract from the New York Yankees. There were the whole Cubs rumors. So it's like at this point, until Ken Rosenthal says that he has confirmed sign with blank team, I'm just, I'm not going to put really any stock in anything because just the other day they said the Twins are now emerging as the favorites to sign him. And now all of a sudden, oh, the Brewers have made him an offer. Is this the team that signs him? So until he's actually signed somewhere, I'm not even going to put any stock in the rumors at this point. Yeah, I've so just, I just stopped being interested in in rumors anymore of those the top free agents. Now I just look for rumors of where is Christian Yelich going to get traded to. Yeah, because it sounds like from what I saw, there are some. Again, I'm going to use the word rumors because that's what they are. There are some rumors saying that. The asking price for Yelich is starting to go down just because of the desired wanting for him to leave. So if the Cubs somehow got him for a really reasonable price, that would be pretty sweet. Because imagine oh, yeah. having Christian Yelich as your leadoff guy. That would solve your issues. Yeah, it'd solve a lot of issues that the Cubs have. And I think I think realistically, you look at how bad that Derek Jeter's already gotten swindled in other trades. That why can't you just swindle him for Christian Yelich, especially when his agent came out and said that his, like the player wants to be traded, so you know he doesn't want to be there, and uh, that just makes a motivation for the team to go crap. Well, we got to trade him, and if uh, if you've got a if you've got a a naive GM uh, and he's already backed in a corner, you take advantage of him. Right, exactly. Here's another question I had for you during this whole off-season thing. What did you think about what the Pirates are doing? And take away the whole financial thing. J just think about what they're doing and how they're trying to sell them as a contending team. Like, does that... To, to me, that... On paper, that helps the Cubs to a division title. But, you know, they could still be pesky, but it's that whole thing is just weird. I think they're more likely to be uh, break the record for the fastest team that went from almost 100 wins to almost 100 losses as they are to be uh, a contending team. Yeah, I definitely don't think they're very good. I just have that weird feeling that they're going to be pesky. Not good, pesky. But if they just absolutely suck and lose nearly 100 games, would I be surprised? Not at all. Not no, at I, don't, all. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing there. Um, I, but I, this is what they do. They, they've done this before. I don't know why, yeah, it, but they do it. Yeah, is if if I was a Brewers or a Brewers, if I was a Pirates fan, I would be really frustrated, um, and especially after the the way the Steelers went out, that that yeah. was, you know, you you really have nothing else to hang your hat on, because within just a few days, the Pirates traded away Garrett Cole to the Astros, got a meh return. They have they had a good piece in return, nothing overwhelmingly amazing, not like the White Sox trading Chris Sale. 
Then the Steelers lost at home in the first round. And then they traded away their franchise player, their best player that they've had since Barry Bonds for what I thought was a very underwhelming return. Imagine being a Pittsburgh fan within that week. Yeah, you just basically gave away players. It was, um, yeah, it was, all of the returns were meh. Like I, I was not, I was not impressed. And I don't think any of those, um, any of those returns are going to be something that, um, you know, helps them rebuild. I think you're better off just keeping Garrett Cole and and waiting till he signs somewhere else and get the compensatory pick. You're better off with that than you are with, you know, uh, I don't know. I think I think they'd be ultimately ultimately better than what they they got in return with the trade for the Astros. Right. Yeah, I agree. Also, think about it this way. They just extended their closer like another few years. So that makes it more confusing to me. So it's not like it seems like a full out rebuild. I, I almost feel like they're just doing these moves, just kind of doing them. It's so weird. Yeah, it, it's like it's like a Jim Hendry move, except you're not going to sign a big money free agent. Right, exactly. Because think about it. The Pirates don't sign big free agents. They don't go out and open the checkbook. Yeah, they don't. They don't at all. Um, so uh, I don't know what they're doing. And it's it's good for the Cubs because clearly it's going to help them. I mean, the Reds, the Reds are not going to be that good. Um, the Pirates definitely aren't going to be good. And you hope that you hope that some of the moves the Cardinals made don't help them and hurt them, and that just leaves the the Brewers. Yeah, I think if I'm looking at the division race now, I still think that it's going to come down to Cubs Cardinals. To me, there's no doubt that the Cardinals are going to be good, but the main question is, are they better than the Cubs? And I'm trying to say this without much bias, but I don't really think they are better than the Cubs right now. They have good players. The Cubs have some young star players. Ozuna was a good get. They got a really good bullpen piece in the Gritchick trade. They have Dexter Fowler, also good. We'll see what Paul DeYoung does this year. Matt Carpenter's getting old. Yadier Molina's on his last leg. So, I, I don't know. As long as the Bears, the Bears, as long as the Cubs beat their division opponents, they should still win the division. Now, we'll see what happens with Milwaukee if this U Darvish thing happens or not. I'm just saying standing right now. I just don't see a big name free agent like pitcher going to Milwaukee, but you never say never, especially in this weird offseason. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. At this point, anyone could go anywhere. Heck, let's get crazy. The Mets will sign Jake Arrieta. It's at this point, expect the unexpected almost. Yeah. So, I, but I still think, I still think the Cardinals, the Cubs are going to be better off playing the Cardinals with the pieces they got in the Gritchick trade than them having Gritchick kill the Cubs at their, his bat. 359 batting average, OPS over a thousand, and I think like something a third of his 22 home runs were hit against the Cubs. Yeah, I think I think the Cubs are better off with him being shipped to where do you go, Toronto? Yes. Yeah, I think they're better off because then they see him like once <laughs> rather than all the time. A lot of yeah. Yeah, that, believe me, I was very happy when he was out of the division. Think about this, too. McCutcheon's out of the division. Cub killer. Cole was out of the division. Except for the meaningful game, Cub killer. And now, Randall Gritchick is out of the division. Cub killer. Yeah, it's good for the Cubs. <laughs> uh, yeah. So now the Cubs just need to move forward with getting a closer, another starting pitcher, and a leadoff hitter. 
<laughs> with pitchers and catchers reporting in like what three weeks. Yep, it's coming fast. It's coming real fast, and and um, I just I still have a lot of question marks about this team. The Cubs? I don't think. Yeah, I don't think they're a bad team by any stretch. Uh, just have they added enough to compete with the Dodgers and the Astros and the Yankees? Well, the way I see it is, though they like the rotation as it is, even though they want to add, I still think it would be important to add another one. Even if you bite the bullet and give Cobb a decent amount of money, I say you do it. Because Mike Montgomery has shown promise, but we haven't really seen the consistency. Where Cobb, at least, you pretty much know where you're getting from him. And then, I think the lineup... It's still got so much depth, and I think that having Chili Davis as your coach, the hitting coach, I should say, will improve them a bit more. And I think they did the right things in the bullpen. They revamped the bullpen. Obviously, bullpens are fickle, so it's really hard to predict what they do. So I think the Cubs are still in a really good spot. But at the same time, I see why there would be some forms of concern. Also... The Dodgers are going to be really stinking good, but are they going to be as stinking good as they were last year? Because last year was historically good for them, and they didn't even win the World Series. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, you just want to see the Cubs play more consistently, and and I guess they'll they'll be much better off if you can get them like they did in 2016, where uh, where guys were much more patient at the plate and taking more pitches. Um, so hopefully you can get a little bit of more patience. And I know teams, that's how they were attacking the Cubs is throwing more strikes and making them swing rather than working the count and letting them get on base and, and wearing your starting pitching out. But, uh, you know, you have to have a, a counter for whatever they do. And if they're going to throw balls, you need to be able to lay off of them. And if they're going to throw strikes, you need to be aggressive and, and you know, you don't have to clobber them all out of the park, but you got to, you could be able to knock those uh, for bloopers and, and line drives and, and get on base. Yeah. I think one thing that we have to talk about going into this year, if, if you're going to talk from an offensive perspective, they really got to cut down on the strikeouts. I don't think there's any doubt about that. That's a given. Yeah. Um, but again, Chili Davis is one of the best in the business. And I think there's not enough hype around Chili Davis being their, their coach. Because if you look what he did in both Boston and the uh, Oakland, they were like among the top teams in offense and least in strikeouts. So not only were they really good, they were disciplined as heck. And I just don't think that gets enough talk about. A lot of people were kind of trying to twist the whole coaching staff as a negative. And I know we talked about this on a few episodes earlier, but man, I just, I think they made this coaching staff better this year. If you want to talk about a spot where I think the Cubs are better, I think it's the coaching staff. I, I mean, pitching. Yeah. I mean, they had a good staff last year. I think the the big improvement this year is I feel like Joe, when it comes crunch time, isn't going to feel so alone. Yeah, because you got his guys. Real, yeah, it's his guys now. And before, I just felt like he had good people, but I just he didn't. I don't think he had the the camaraderie or the you know the synergy with them as he is with bringing in his guys. And I think, I think you're going to see a much, uh, a much better coaching staff because of, of the synergy uh, that this, this group is going to bring. Right now, here is another thing that I, I wanted to ask you looking at the team going into this season, you're looking at every aspect of it. The hitting, the defense, the pitching, the coaching staff. If there's one thing, just one thing you had to 
really think about in a negative way and that you're kind of worried about if there's just one thing, even if it's little, what's the biggest thing? Cause I, I want, I want to know what yours is. Who's going to close the game. Hmm. Well, I think it's going to be either more or C check. And, and I don't think that's bad, but you know, I, I think, I think, that the key for them winning the World Series was was having a, a, a guy that that they could just send out in in, in a uh, high leverage situation and just shut it down. And last year they had Wade Davis. It was high leverage situation. You, you know, you you could count on him. And I just I just don't know if either of those guys is the guy. And I think ultimately you probably hope that Carl Edwards will be the guy, but he scares the crap out of me in that situation with his lack of control. Not his stuff, his lack of control. Yeah, the stuff is there. He needs to get it under control. To me, I think you start with Morrow and then C-Sheck would kind of be your backup idea because C-Sheck has a lot of experience in the closer role. So you brought up the whole high leverage closer situation, and I agree that is very essential. And it's going to be really hard to replace Wade Davis because he's honestly the best closer the Cubs have had in a while, like a while. He was just nails. Even when he struggled, he still got the job done. He would get out of jams or just completely dominate you. Either way, he got the job done. Now, it's interesting to think about the World Series the past few years because the elite shutdown closers struggled mightily. Whether it was uh, Giles, whether it was Jansen, Chapman, Miller, look at the last two World Series and those closers just tanked. And look at 2015 with uh, Juris Familia. He tanked too. He blew several saves. I just think that's interesting. I think it's a little... It's a, it's definitely true, but at least with the last two years, I think it's been a situation of, well, at least with the, when the Cubs won, I think it was a, though they rode those guys so hard that I think it was a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of, you know, the longer a batter sees a pitcher, you know, especially a, a bullpen guy. Where starters, you know, they they're going to see go through the rotation several times. But when you see a closer multiple times, the advantage starts going to the hitter, and especially when that bullpen arm has fatigue. And I think that's what you happen with the Indians um, because they rode those guys uh, like Andrew Miller got ridden hard, um, and and the Cubs rode a uh, rolled as Chapman hard. And he just didn't have anything left in the tank in that game seven. Sure. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the big reasons. Chapman is the prime example of that. But look how much they use Jansen. Ken Giles, he just kind of struggled. Just struggled, period. Uh, Andrew Miller definitely fits in the category you just talked about. So what I think is really important that the Cubs potentially have is that they have bullpen depth. So if one doesn't work in a key situation, you could go to someone else. Now, this would also mean that Carl Edwards Jr. has to get consistency under his control, but I still think there's a lot of promise for that because the stuff is just really, really good. But C-Sheck is a really good reliever. Morrow was a really good reliever last year. You re-signed Brian Dunsing. You have Carl Edwards Jr. Pedro Strope has been consistently good. So there may not be the closer, like the definition of a closer, like Wade Davis was the definition of a closer, Aroldis Chapman's the definition of a closer, but they have options. So I think they that's also, a good thing. They also have an X factor. Is what if they get... Justin Wilson back to form. Exactly. If they get him back to form, they're golden. Because think about he, it. Think about it. You have several lefties and several righties you can rely on then. Yeah. The just my concern is 
Justin Wilson, you get what you got. And Carl Edwards is inconsistent with his control. Um, Morrow is, is, uh, you know, the innings get him. Um, and then you're, you're left with minimal options. That's just my concern. It's like a guy like Wade Davis was just boom, shut down. That was it. It was done. You handed him the ball and, and it was, you, you know, it was, it ended up being an eight inning game because the ninth was locked down. I'll tell um, you, I am going to miss having Wade Davis. Even if this pen does really work out, which I, I think it will, not and not having Wade Davis, ugh, it it, it kind of stinks. I mean, like, wait, were you were you alive when when uh, the Cubs had Mitch Williams? No. Yeah, so I lived through that, and that was just. I mean, he was good, but it was just you you couldn't relax. Like your blood pressure went through the roof when he went up there because you never knew if he was going to hit the batter, walk him on four pitches, give up a home run or strike him out on three pitches. Like you had no clue. There was, there was, I mean, Wade Davis, you go up there and you just sort of, you can put your feet up, put your hands, you know, behind your head and relax. Mitch Williams is your blood pressure went up. You're like, oh my God, they've got they've only got a six run lead. Mitch Williams is coming in. You'll bite your fingernails. <laughs> well, that's kind of how I felt with Marmel for many years. Yeah, pretty much. Um so yeah, that that's my big concern. I don't know what yours is. Yeah, mine is it's it's kind of that, even though I try to look at it from the optimistic view. I think one of my concerns may be, though I have a lot of confidence in the rotation, I just, there's part of me that's a little worried that, like, John Lester may continue to slip a little bit, even though I'm 90% confident he's going to rebound. There's that little part of me is just worried because the rotation needs to be really good. And I really hope that they do add somebody because. You need all the starting pitching you can get, especially in baseball in this day and age. And like I said, I, I'm really confident in John Lester, but there, there's a little bit of concern there. I think Kyle Hendricks is going to be good. I think Quintana is going to be good. Um, I, I, I like Tyler Chatwood, and I really hope that works out. John Lester, just the top of the rotation. I just hope there's consistency. Yeah, and plus... Um, you know, John Lester is also older. Right, that's the thing. And and Hendricks did have an injury last year. Is if having a, a another you know front of the, the rotation starter, it a it gives you it gives you you know no gimmies. I mean, for the other team, uh, come playoffs when you go to a four man rotation, is there's no oh crap, um. You know, this terrible pitcher is pitching. You know, we're going to have to score 18 runs. Uh, so it gives you four solid guys to go to in the playoffs. Um, also, if you have a significant injury, is you don't have to pull somebody in from, from Iowa and cross your fingers. Right. Um, it, it gives you, you just, you don't skip a beat. You know, you move, um, you know, you move somebody up and and you're you're okay. Uh, and in those the dog days when you're playing, you know, twenty nine games in thirty days, and you go to a six man, is it's that's a, a hell of a six man rotation. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, I really have confidence in John Lester. But when you're in your mid thirties and you got a lot of miles on you, the concern does grow a little bit. I think it's just kind of natural. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, are any of the, the concerns I have with the Cubs like, like, oh my God, they're not going to make the playoffs. I, I'm fully confident they'll make the playoffs. Um, it's, it's, do they have enough to compete for the World Series? Like this year, they didn't have enough. I mean, they, they got by the Nationals and they just got steamrolled by 
by the Dodgers. And the Dodgers gonna got steamrolled by the you know the Astros. So it was yeah, you know, they, they weren't winning the World Series this year. And you know, part of me and next year Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and next year you're gonna throw in some other teams in the mix, like, you know, the Yankees that are that are gonna be coming from the American League that are gonna be ass kickers. Yeah, the Yankees are gonna be scary for quite some time. Uh, but there was another topic that you want to discuss about with the Cubs, and and that was uh, the issue with uh, the former face of the franchise, Sammy Suser, or Voldemort in some cases. <laughs> Do you remember that when there was like a, a congressman and uh, he was honoring Sammy Suser and Mike yeah. McGuire? <laughs> I was like, he screwed up both Suser. guys. Like, he didn't even get, just get one wrong. Suser and Mike McGuire. Uh, so I'm assuming that you want to discuss the the Rickett statement uh, about Sammy Sosa, right? Yes, exactly. So basically, in case you didn't know, Tom Ricketts said that if he comes clean about PEDs, that they'll let him back and invite him back. And I don't... I don't like the way they're handling this. I think that saying that kind of thing, there's just a lot of hypocrisy in it. You employed Manny Ramirez, even though Manny Ramirez has come clean. I don't think that's quite the same, but still, you did a bunch of other things, but you're playing the moral high ground on steroids where you won a the world, guy playing an ear. Yeah, you won a World Series with a role as Chapman. Your, your moral right. high ground isn't very high. Right, exactly. And even though there's a lot of likable guys on the team, for that reason, especially with Chapman, the moral high ground isn't always there. And plus, I mean, the whole PEDs thing to me, it, for a while, it's like, yeah, the, the cheating, yeah. But you think about how many guys did it. The PEDs is not really what gets to me about the Sosa situation. But going back to Ricketts, I'll get back to the other point in a minute. I think... If Ricketts really just doesn't want to bring him back or there's some reason they don't want him back, I really think all he had to say was, we're, we're just not interested in that right now. I think that's all he had to say. I really don't think that the PEDs is truly the sole reason they're not going to bring him back. I felt like it was his way of thinking that's going to be a good excuse by taking the moral high ground, but people could kind of see through that. Yeah, what's interesting is when Sammy was here, they didn't even own the team. So it's not like right. like if they would have owned the team at the time and there could have been like, oh, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that went down that there's baggage there. It's not the case. It's they, they didn't own the team. They were just fans at that point. So like I understand you want Sammy to come clean because post-baseball Sammy has been just an absolute embarrassment. But during his career, he was the face of your franchise and he was the face of the baseball's return uh, after, you know, nearly dying during the, the, you know, the lockout, the strike. Well, absolutely. Because, yeah, you may not like Sammy now, but if you're a Cub fan, you can't honestly tell me you didn't stand and cheer every time he came to the plate and every time he hit one onto Waveland Avenue. I mean, he brought a very boring, lifeless, just gray franchise back to life in the 90s because that's what the Cubs were from 1990 to 1990, I'd say seven, because that's when he really started to hit his, his peak. The Cubs were not interesting whatsoever. There's nothing interesting about them. And baseball itself was just, it was boring and no one really enjoyed it as much. And then the the whole McGuire Sosa thing happened and all the home runs and it made it made it fun again. And I don't think people can deny that they stood there and cheered the whole time. Absolutely. And you know, it's I, do they have moral high ground about not bringing Mark Grace back because you know uh his drunk driving issues um like where where do they draw the line? Like I'm 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 firmly entrenched in the camp where Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa don't belong in the Hall of Fame. That's, but 
do I think that they should be brought back for fan fest and, and, you know, sing the seventh inning stretch and blah, blah, blah. Oh, absolutely. I don't bring him back. Yeah. I think the whole hall of fame slash bring back, I think those are two really different issues and I'm sure you agree too. So I don't, I right now I really don't care about Sammy in the hall of fame uh, when it comes to this issue, because I just think that this is really more of a relationship between the Cubs and him, but I don't know about you, but I do have a few other theories about the whole Sammy exile thing. And I was wondering if you had any as well. I, I don't have any theories. I, there's just gotta be something because uh, I mean, Mark McGuire has been a hitting instructor. Barry Bonds is, you know, who's, he was a hitting has come back to. Yeah. So you, these guys, other guys have come back and not Sammy. And he, he was arguably just as important to the Cubs as, those other two players were to the Cardinals or the the Giants, and if not more, and I, there's got to be something. I just I just don't know what it is. Well, somebody brought this up. I think it was Mike Murphy on uh, ESPN 1000. I, I didn't think about this, but I was driving to the grocery store Saturday morning, and they were talking about the whole situation. <clears throat> Excuse me, and. He brought up an interesting theory that I'm not saying it's true, but it's something to think about. Maybe a lot of those Cubs alumni that come back, they tell the Cubs they don't want to see Sammy. Because whether you liked Sammy or not, no matter how important he was, his teammates hated him with a passion. Oh, yeah. He was a he was a terrible teammate. So I can't help but wonder if people like Kerry Wood or people like Carlos Sombrano or, or any other people from that era just kind of t- told Ricketts or whoever would contact them. He's like, look, if Sammy's going to be there, I frankly don't want to be there. And again, I'm not saying that this is the reason. I don't know what the reason is, but it is something that I think is something that you at least got to think about. Yo, know, Kerry Wood definitely didn't like him. Um, Boombox in a million pieces. I, yeah, so it's uh, it, it's definitely a, an interesting theory, and I, I would not be surprised at all. It's just the, the big – you alluded to this before, but the big problem is that Tom Ricketts could have just nipped this in the bud and said, um, you know, we're – you know, we're not doing it at this time and just been done. Yeah, with just it. say it's it's not on our priority right now. Uh it's it's just not. I sure people will still be on They could have given they could have they they could have given a Bill Belichick answer and been like, uh, we're focused on the season. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot of people th- th- there's a lot of conflict in this because you watch the Cubs convention and you see some of the schmoes they bring back. I mean, it is kind of funny, but I, I still think it would have been better just say, we're not interested right now. It's just, it's not really on our priority list right now. Will people, will everyone be happy about it? No, but at least you're not creating a, a false sense of moral high ground when it's, you, you look worse taking that moral high ground instead of just saying, that's not what we're going to do right now. Yeah, because I mean, you can... After that, if you're just like, no, we're not going to do it this time, people can second guess you. They can be upset about it, but there's there's nothing they can attack you on it. Like, but if you say that Sammy has to apologize, then you're you're creating further media issues because people are going to ask questions about you. What makes you the person that has to say this when you didn't say it about this and this and this and then Sammy's going to respond to it probably. And you're just creating a snowball effect. When if you would have just said, uh, not at this time. Yeah. Then it just, well, that's a fact. It's not at this time. It's clearly not at this time because, um, you know, it's, he's not here. Exactly. It's, it's, it's something that's going on. Cause think about it. Sammy left in 2004. It's now 2018. It's been over a decade since Sammy's been back in the light. 
And to me, it just doesn't seem like either side has handled it very well. Uh, so until there's a big statement made by one of these sides or a big decision, Sammy's just going to remain in exile. I mean, just think of the, the exit that uh, Carlos Zambrano had. And he's back in the fold. Yeah. <laughs> so, and and Big Z was 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 a nightmare. And you know, I, I think even as big of a nightmare as he was, to me, I, I feel like the Cubs and Zambrano still at least had a, a decent relationship. Unlike Sammy Sosa, because even though Zambrano was a nutcase, I don't think his team disliked him as much as they disliked Sammy. I don't think it's possible for anybody to dislike somebody more than teammates. Did you Sammy. ever read Paul Bacco's uh, post 2004 mortem uh, kind of account from ESPN? No, he was interviewed basically after the 2004 season, after they collapsed and Sammy walked out and he just said how, how just sick everyone was of Sammy and how losing that season felt worse than 2003. So I think that kind of says a lot right there. And no, I'm not trying to quote hate on Sammy. I'm not trying to say he wasn't relevant to the Cubs. I'm just stating the fact that he was not liked at all by his teammates. That's just a fact. Yeah, I mean, my view as a fan is a lot different than somebody that dealt yeah, with him day in day out. Because I've never met Sammy. I've never met the man in my life. Um, but I, yeah, definitely was one that cheering home runs and you know watching every one of his at bats when they'd cut in. If even if you were watching something else and they'd cut into his at bats on ESPN, um, it was, uh, you know, it was awesome. But yeah, again, I didn't have to deal with him day in, day out. You didn't have to work with him. You didn't have to talk to him. You didn't really see what he was like behind the scenes, even though you could tell he was into himself as he succeeded. But we liked it because it was entertaining and it was fun and it made the Cubs relevant again. But when you look back at it, you understand why other teammates wouldn't like it. You have to put yourself in the shoes of both the team, the officials who run the team, the front office, and the fans. It, it's it's very different. And honestly, as long as they keep putting trotting out a a winning team, I don't care if they bring Sammy back or not. Yeah, there's as much as I wouldn't mind seeing them bring him back. It's. Rizzo and Bryant are the heroes of this team. They're the ones leading this team. They're the ones who have accomplished what no one has accomplished in a century. They're in the middle of winning. It's probably a bit more important right now to think about that kind of thing. I think this would be a much bigger story if the Cubs were still bad, but they're not. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, if I'm going to like a Cubs convention or I'm going to some event where they're bringing back alumni... Honestly, I if you're putting my list of and this is coming from somebody that was a Sammy Sosa fan, is Andre Dawson ahead of him, and he is there. Ryan Sandberg ahead of him, definitely. Uh, so it's you know you've got guys that are ahead of him as far as my interest level is of being associated with the team and being brought back for special events. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know you're, who you're going to get. You, you know you're going to get Sandberg. You know you're going to get Billy Williams. You know you're going to get Andre Dawes. You're going to get the Hall of Famers who are still living. Uh, so those are guys that people really do like to see the most or those type of guys, even though there's a lot of eager to see Sammy Sosa. You know you're going to get those guys, but... Yeah, th this whole thing is very weird, I think, and who knows when it's going to end, if it ever ends. I, I will say this. I thought it was cool seeing Derek Lee back. I thought that was cool. I love Derek Lee. Me too. But honestly, one of my all-time favorite Cubs is Mark Grace. And I just don't see them bringing him back either. 
I don't know if they have, but I'd... Yeah, I know he sung the stretch he... while he was broadcasting with Arizona, but that's all I could think of off the top of my head. Yeah, because, um, you know, he he's had some issues. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like his situation may be a little different. I, I don't know what his situation is, but... I know alcoholism is a legit problem and people really do battle it in a difficult way. Like it wasn't him going, being a jerk to people. At least I, I, I shouldn't say that. I really don't know what his situation is like. I just know alcoholism is a very, very tricky subject and it could just kind of be more of a, a, a sad story of someone struggling with abusing substance. So, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult one to tackle. Yeah, but you you always have to enjoy a guy who who smokes cigarettes, you know, before and after games. And you know what's interesting? He had more hits than any other player in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, he was like a doubles machine. Yeah, he was. I mean, the Cubs have been blessed with great first basemen over the years. Did I tell you about the article I wrote last week with Cubby's crib of who they should bring back or try to? No. Aramis Ramirez. Yeah, I, I would like that. Because he was really kind of the cornerstone of the Cubs for many years. Yeah, he really was. I mean, that was a that was an amazing trade that they, they used to, to bring him over. He destroyed the that Pirates was, in that one. Yeah. Um, you know what's sad, though? Hmm. Is Grace Grace didn't even get the five percent uh, of Hall of Fame vote to to stay on future ballots? Yeah, I, is is he a Hall of Famer? I don't think so. But was he good enough that he should have been on a couple of ballots? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I think so too. I'm looking at his career stats right now. Three time Gold Glover. He had two thousand four hundred forty five hits. Career three hundred three three eighty three. 442 slash line. We all knew he was never a, a home run hitter. He averaged about 15 a year, but boy, he was just a good hitter. 383 career on base. That is really dang good. If you think that he could have been a power hitter and maybe played, I don't know, another year or so, it, things may be a little different with him, but he definitely deserved to be on the ballot a little longer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, he's another guy that didn't strike out much either. Um, I'm looking at his strikeout numbers right now. The most he struck out in a season was 56 times. That's it. Yeah, he he is a great contact hitter. Um, you know, fantastic on base percentage, and you know, that's a guy that you would have loved to have now on a, with baseball now uh he was just a he, there was you weren't going to find too many better fielders than him and you know look at his doubles numbers here's uh, I, I compiled some stats here his prime years from say i mean they were all really consistently good years but his prime years i i'd say were from 1992 to 2000 and you compile these yeah. stats together and you have a slash of 312, 393, and an OPS of 854. For a guy who didn't hit a lot of home runs to have that kind of OPS, that's pretty impressive. He had 345 doubles in that time. Yeah, he, he was a fantastic baseball player. And so underrated. Really was. And you couldn't help but be happy for him when he won a World Series. Yeah, and um, yeah, you hope that he got all of his, you know, demons under control. Absolutely. Um, yeah, he was he was one of my f favorites all time. Um, so wait, trivia question. Yes. He finished runner up in rookie of the year voting. Um, who who beat him? That would have been eighty eight. That would have been 88. Oh, boy. 
boy. I'm trying to... You need a hint. I'll give you the team. All right, give it to me. Cincinnati. Cincinnati. You might even forgot this guy existed. I mean, I'm trying to think of Reds. Chris Sabo. Who the hell is that? <laughs> uh, that was like my heyday because I was a kid was collecting the baseball. Right, I'm going to look him up right now. He was the third. He was a third baseman. He was he was actually a fairly good hitter, um, you know, for his career. He didn't play that many years. Here we go. Yeah. Um, his first few years, he was pretty good, but then he kind of tanked. Yeah, I don't remember what happened. He just sort of fell off, and um, but I was a kid, so I don't really remember. But he was good. Uh, that that uh, rookie of the year voting. Chris Zabo won. Mark Race was second. Tim Belcher, Ron Gant, Roberto Alomar, Damon Berryhill, and Greg Jeffries were the top uh, six vote getters. Well, Roberto Alomar was a pretty notable name. Yeah, Chris Sabo. I mean, his career slash 268, 326, 445. Not bad, not great. Those are actually pretty average numbers. Chris Sabo. <laughs> yeah. Boy, those glasses he's wearing, they're like goggles. That's what he's best known for. I mean, it looks like he's about to do a, a, a science experiment in seventh grade. He won a World Series, though. Yeah, good for him. And it was a three-time All-Star. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess we can wrap this show up with... Probably a real downer topic. Yeah. The Blackhawks. Yeah. Uh, so the big news is uh, what's going on with Corey Crawford. Uh, we're hearing reports now done for the season probably with you know, uh, vertigo-like symptoms, a.k.a. concussions. Um, and... I don't know if you listened to uh, Dan Bernstein in the afternoon, but he raised a really good point is when is it? When was the last time anybody saw Corey Crawford? Who knows? They're being so secretive about all this. I, who knows? Uh, I mean, it, it's like, where is he? Is he, is he back in Canada? Is, is he just not showing up to thing? Like what, what's he doing? That's that's a huge question, and and then you've gotten, uh, you know, Bowman saying one thing to Chicago media and then going up into Canada, like the the radio broadcasts don't come down here, um, and, and saying another thing. It's like we don't really <laughs> know what's happening with Crawford. And, uh, is is the concussions that bad? Yeah, I I really don't know this whole thing has been handled very strangely we know pretty much nothing even though they've come out and said a few things like you said those questions loom is he in canada is he here what's his condition is there more to this that we don't know i don't know I, who the hell knows I, I, is he in active some sort of active treatment or is he just kind of chilling waiting for this to get better what's going on and how severe is it that's i think that's my big question is really how severe is it yeah, and, and, you know, Quenville, several weeks ago, they were asked, are we going to see Corey Crawford again this season? And he goes, um, I hope so. Like, mm, that, that's not encouraging not either. We, we, we all had to know something was going on because first it was day-to-day, -day, then it just kind of lingered pretty long. Um, and Anisimov was what we thought was a worse injury, and he ended up being back on the ice and – and just no word of Crawford. And I mean, and ultimately for this season, doesn't really matter. If we don't see him anymore, it is what it is. But clearly we've seen that the goaltending that we have in his stead is not enough for us to just even sniff winning a Stanley Cup. You know, 
I'm going to finally say it, but this team is kind of a mess right now. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, especially so they had a week break their their bye week, if you will. And the game going into it, they just absolutely stunk it up against the the Detroit Red Wings. And we sort of chalked it up a little bit to, well, you know, mentally they were already checked into their break. But then they came out of their break and just pooped the bed against the Islanders. Pooping the bed is an understatement. It was, it was, a, it was bad. I mean, I when I turned that game on and they scored right away, I was like, awesome. This is a, this is a good way to come out of the break. And then it just spiraled down really badly after that. And, and you're just like, you bracketed both games, the before and after game of your break, just being absolutely abysmal games. Uh, this team is in real trouble. Yeah, and I just think that they are in one of the worst possible positions because as their record stands right now, they're not bad enough to like tank, but they're not good enough to contend. And we don't know what the status is of the team's MVP, or at least the team's one of the two teams' best players that's not named Patrick Kane. This is just a huge, huge mess. And I feel like there's a lot of desire to like, oh, still go for it. I know, I understand the NHL playoffs are a crapshoot, but can you honestly tell me this team, the way they're playing right now, is built for the playoffs this year? No. No, they're they're not good enough. Um, and maybe they could steal a series, but that would that would even be hard pressed to, to imagine that. And and you're right, they're in a really bad spot. Their their record is not bad enough to get a top pick, and they're not good enough to compete in the playoffs. And on top of that, is you know looking a little closer. Uh, I mean, they're definitely not going to be buyers at this point. That would just be silly. But they're like, all right, well, if you're not a buyer, then you're a seller. What can the Blackhawks realistically sell? No. And Kane's not going anywhere. Nope. Tate is not going anywhere. Nope. Crawford's not going anywhere. Um, Seabrook has a no trade clause. Duncan Keith has a no trade clause. You're not going to trade. Um, you know, young, young and guys that you have to bring under control, are going anywhere. Uh, like, the, yeah, they're they're not going anywhere. Um, so what? What realistically? What realistically do you have to trade? You know what? The, the trade piece that I always talked about now that's kind of out of the question because of injury. I think if Artem Anisimov was completely healthy throughout the season, I think he'd be a great trade chip. He's got to get healthy before the deadline because I think a contending team could use another guy like him who has good net front presence and can score on the power play. I think he would be your best trade chip. Yeah, what what is he going to bring you back though? That's the thing. Um, Probably not it, much, but it would it would clear some cap off the books. That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah, I mean the thing is, is you need you need you've got a bunch of underperforming forwards. Uh, you're you're vastly short of of top four defensemen, and your goalie, who's one of the best in hockey, is very likely going to miss the rest of the season, and if not the rest of the season, significant portion of the season. And you know, if he's even if he's healthy enough to come back towards the end, if the Blackhawks are out of it, what what is the point of bringing him back? You know, he's, so he can get another concussion. Just let him. Write it out. So you're probably not going to see Corey Crawford for the rest of the season. Yeah, I just, I also feel like there's no reason to rush Corey Crawford back at this point. I, I know a lot of people are going to hate me for this, but I feel like we've pretty much reached the point where the Blackhawks' chances at a playoff are kind of in the toilet and going down. I know I've been saying, wait, 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 but I just, right now, there's no reason for me to believe that they're going to turn it around. These last two losses, 
I know there's some hockey left, but if you look at what they have to do to get into the playoffs, they have to win a ton of games. And without Corey Crawford, I I just think that this past week or two weeks might have been kind of one of the final nails in the coffin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just just look at the way they play. So underperforming. And and I'm going to go out and say it is that fourth line has not been good. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that are like, well, they, they provide energy. But at what point can you say if that energy is not getting you any goals and not getting you any wins, what good is it? There's just, there's no consistency there. There's really no consistency with anything. That's, that's one of the worst parts. The only thing that they're consistent with is consistently being inconsistent and the defense just pooping the bed night in and night out. Yeah. And, 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 and any line first or fourth, there's no consistency. Uh, and you can't figure out who your top line is. It's sod and taves and, and then a merry-go-round of other players. If you can't figure out who your top want, line is, then it's really hard to picture you winning uh, a Stanley Cup. Yeah, exactly. Now, I wanted, a lot of people are starting to bring up the sod trade and now saying that it was a bad trade and that Panarin is like, well, Panarin doesn't play defense. Panarin wouldn't have helped this defense. And one of the reasons they made this trade was to get another goaltender. Unfortunately, Forsberg has not worked out, but there was a lot of hope that he would work out. The Blackhawks had to do something and get a goaltender at the time because since Darling left, there was nobody else. It was basically going to have to be Jeff Glass. And imagine if we didn't have Forsberg and it was Jeff Glass, who else would it be? JF Berube? So they had to do something there. Yeah, and and you know what? Honestly, is has Forsberg been awful? No, he's just not gonna. He's not Corey Crawford. We're used to elite goaltending, and in short bursts, Glass and Forsberg have been have been all right. And even last night, uh, was seven goals given up. Um, Forsberg. Like some some of them didn't look good at all, but some of them were he just, gave up some soft ones. Yeah, but but the defense in front of him was just abysmal. Jan Ruda it was bad. Jan Ruda looked lost out there. Yeah, it's it it was bad. It was very bad. You know, this may sound weird, but I kind of compare Anton Forsberg to the defense of Starling Castro where he'll make a really, really big defensive play, and then he'll just boot a completely routine one. I mean, that, that's not a terrible comparison. Uh, I mean, you know, he's a he's fine to spell uh, your starting goaltender or fill in a couple of games of an injury, but if you're going to go more than half the season with the guy, no, that's not, it's not what you need to be – a uh, you know competing for a Stanley Cup. I mean, it's one thing if you would have had a stud defense in front of you, but but you don't. I mean, if their defense was still elite, yes, but like you said, they don't. I mean, Duncan Keith is the only and and, and you know, believe me, I know where he's at compared to where he was a couple years ago. He's the only like legitimate top four defenseman that we have. And even he's not doing that great now either. Yeah, he's he's slow. He's you know, and he's showing he's showing some age, uh, a quite a good amount of age. Seabrook looks terrible, and then you've got you've got eight defensemen, and you can't figure out who you know who you're going to go with. It, it it's really I mean you need and it was really more frustrating too is you saw Nicoletti play well last night. Yeah. Yeah, believe me, I think about that a lot. Yeah, I don't think Nick Letty's the answer per se, but just to see guys that we gave or you know we we didn't retain playing well, you know, just like, oh, we could we could use some defensemen about this time. Um, so I yeah, I I don't know what the answer is. I, I mean, I guess the the only real hope is you can try to dump some salary and. And with the young guys you have under, you know, entry level deals that you can maybe go out and, and bring in some, 
you know, short term defenseman until you could develop somebody or draft somebody. Yeah, it's it, it's they're going to have to do some major retooling here, and it may take a few years. This isn't something that really makes me angry because we were so blessed to have them be so dominant for so long and bring us multiple championships. It's just kind of sad because though we knew that the window was going to close at some point, I didn't think it would be this fast. And maybe the window will reopen soon if they do some retooling, but let's face it, they're not winning it this year. At no, least I, unless there's some crazy thing that happens, it's not going to happen. Yeah, they're absolutely not going to um, win the, the, the Stanley Cup this year. No way, no how. No, it's, it's, it's just sad. It really is, because I was watching the other day the highlights from that 2013 season, and I would argue that 2013 was the most magical Blackhawks year of them all. And seeing a team that's just kind of mediocre, you compare that to the greatness that was that 2013 team, it's just it's not even close. And I'm reading now that um, Dylan Sakura could be uh, uh, could be this year's Will Butcher if he decides to forego signing with the Blackhawks and tests free agency based on the uh, the decline of the Blackhawks. Yeah. Um, that's that's just frustrating too. Um, Who would have thought it would have come to that so soon? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, we're, we're, we're here. The reality is we're here. So, um, this team is the bottom of the division. Uh, even if they're, they're hanging around you know, that wild card spot is they're they're at the bottom of the division. They're a bottom feeder right now. Yeah. And they, who, who, they realistically even going to beat in a single round, let alone multiple rounds to go to a Stanley cup. It's just, it, it doesn't seem likely. I mean, right now I'm doubting their playoff chances. Would you rather see them sneak into the playoffs and get like, you know, dominated in the first round and lose, or would you rather see them not make it? I think for the sake, for the long term, not making it would mean that there would be more changes. Though Stan Bowman would probably make changes either way. I feel like if things keep going pretty badly before the deadline, I think that's when you got to just pounce, bite the bullet, and say, we got to start making moves for the future. So I, I just don't think squeaking into the playoffs is really, I mean, it's hard because the playoffs are such a crapshoot. Even though you don't look like you're going to have a chance, you just never know. But I feel like if they're if they're really struggling to make the playoffs at the trade deadline, like their chances are really low, don't go for the low chances. Do what's best for your team for the future. Because I think if they don't do that, then you're going to risk more being kind of stuck in mediocrity like the Red Wings were for many years this decade, we don't want that. If if it's going to take maybe a dark year or two to get back to cup contention, I, we, we would take what it takes to get back to cup contention as soon as we can. Yeah, I mean, if, it's, if not making the playoffs is going to be the catalyst to push for some overhaul big changes to bring this team back to you know where we want them to be, then yeah, I'd much rather have them and plus or not make the playoffs. Uh plus if if they make the playoffs and they just get dominated in the first round again, it just really emphasizes to the league that the Blackhawks are their window has closed. Yeah. It's it, it's it's a depressing time. But you know, maybe I just I just hope they don't mortgage the future to try to get a rental goal. I, I, I don't want that either. Especially someone who's just going to... Because whoever you're going to get, 
it's not going to be as good as Crawford. I mean, there's honestly not that many goalies as good as Crawford in the league, but you're definitely not getting somebody as good as Crawford, and you're going to have to give up. Teams know that you're desperate, so they're they know that they've got you, and they're going to get something good, and you're not getting your value for it. I mean, do you really think that the Red Wings would lowball the Hawks, even though they're not in the same conference anymore? No, they wouldn't, because people were talking about Peter Morazic. They're they're trying to rebuild themselves. They're not going to be saying, "Oh, just give us a pick." No, they're, they're gonna they're gonna want more than that. Uh, it's a sucky situation. Yeah. It's a real sucky situation, and, and there's too much of the season left to go to be this depressed already. I know it. It, it does sound kind of silly, completely giving up in January because there's a long way to go. But it's just that the trends and the consistency of the bad with the inconsistency of the scoring, there's just very little reason to have a lot of hope. It sucks to say because I want to hold out hope, but it, right now it's just I, I don't have much of it. And I think that if decisions are made for the future, and that means that that would get us back to cup contention as soon as possible, I th- you, you got to bite the bullet and do it. Especially with Crawford out, you don't want to rush anything. It's almost getting to the point. They're pretty much at the point where it might just cut your lost time and look for the future. Now, we could look like complete jackasses in a few weeks when if things like suddenly turn around drastically. We very well might. I'm just kind of playing the percentages right now. I mean, the only reason that Blackhawks have been hovering around making the playoffs in the wild card is how good Crawford's right. been. So even, I just, you know, we've heard, oh, well, we just got to turn it on and, and play like we can play. How many times can you hear that before guys actually do it? If it was that easy, they would just do it. They kind of let them, well, let's just play better. Okay, let's go out there and dominate. It, it's it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually do it. And then you can't just right. turn it on. So, um. Without Crawford, this team is not very good, and it, it's going to be a long rest of the season. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, well, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to discuss. Nope, not really. Just, uh, you know, we got our Super Bowl set, Eagles, Patriots. Sure, we'll talk about that in the coming weeks, but yeah, nothing really else. I'm going to be... Re- yeah, I hate when uh, it's a game when I want both teams to lose. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, then you're in a no-win For situation. For me personally, uh. I, I I like the Eagles as a team. I like Nick Foles. I like Alshon Jeffrey. I like them as a team, but that's about it. Those damn fans. I know. They're awful. I, I know. <laughs> But that's going to do it. Oh, I, I, so I tweeted out something to uh, Lester Wolfong um, uh, from Woody City Gridiron, and and uh, a Phillies fans were already taking jabs. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, please make sure you subscribe, however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Um, hit us up on social media, Twitter at shy fan, Pat one at Swirsky sports, facebook.com slash Swirsky sports, Swirsky sports.com. Please share with your friends and thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Smoking crack is not legal on the planes. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the Bears go 